It is now time for questions to the Minister for Communities, and we will start with listed questions. I call Roy Beggs to ask the first question. Mr. Beggs. Question number one. <coughs> I can initiate him, Sarah Nider, and I call the Minister. Thank you. Last can call your. Just in respect to the maintenance of existing social homes over this year and the next three years, the Housing Executive has currently programmed some £20 million of investment in improving and maintaining its stock in the East Antrim area. This will involve a range of scheme types, including the replacement of bathrooms, kitchens, electric windows and heating systems, external cyclical maintenance, the installation of external wall insulation and other external improvements. Such a programme will be subject to the necessary funding being available and the time scales required for programme and scheme approvals. In terms of new social homes, uh, the East Antrim Parliamentary constituency, there have been 20 social housing units completed to date in 2019-20, and there are currently 117 social housing units under construction. There are currently 50 social housing units programmed to start through the social housing development programme in 2019-2021. There are 20 units in 2019-20 and 30 units in 2020-2021. Of course, programme schemes can be lost or slipped to future programme years for a variety of reasons, example relating to delays in acquiring sites or difficulties with securing planning permissions. New Decade New Approach committed the Executive to enhance investment in social home starts. Mindful of this, I am currently considering the plans of my Department's Social Housing Development Programme for the next three years, um, and I should soon be able to set these out in detail. Mr Riggs, for a supplementary. <coughs> I thank the Minister for her answer, and it is encouraging to hear that some investment is, will be coming. But recently, uh, I have been trying to assist a disabled constituent who, following major surgery, has been virtually imprisoned in his own private rental pro- property on the first floor for over three months and has been unable to get to some hospital appointments as it requires some four ambulance service personnel. So my question is, Minister, will you review the current inadequate provision of three-bedroom disabled-friendly accommodation uh, within my uh, constituency with a view to providing more? I'm more than happy to look at it, and if you want to share the specific details with me, I'll get the Department and the Housing Executive to address that directly, but more than happy to discuss the wider implications and um, issues that you've raised within your area. Well, David Hilditch. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the information that she's imparted to uh, the Assembly today. Uh, could I also raise uh, a scheme which was to take place this coming April, April 2020? at uh, Braidwell Drive, Sunnylands Grove and Green Island in Carrickfergus. That has now been pushed back supposedly to September. We are always out to try and improve the stock. Can the Minister guarantee that that scheme will take place in September, as I think the funding is already available? Yeah, I'm keen to move with schemes as quickly as possible and if we can bring forward. Um, but I'll double-check that specific scheme for you and then follow that up in writing to you as soon as possible. Minister, can I ask you what plans are there in place to improve the housing executive stock, uh, particularly in places like Foyle? Yeah, we're looking at the quality of stock, and obviously I've raised this at previous questions, and also within the committee, there are obviously huge challenges within the housing executive in terms of the budget requirement that's needed over the next 30 years and indeed the £3 billion of investment that is needed over the next 11 years. I am currently engaging within the Department, also having discussions with the Department of Finance um, around issues such as corporation tax and also the debt legacy issues to see if we can look at something with obviously a priority to ensure that we retain the stock that we have in the time ahead and to make sure that it is fit for purpose. So once I've concluded all of those conversations, I will be laying out plans in terms of the longer term trajectory of the housing executive, which ensures that stock is maintained to the highest standards. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. And can I through you ask the Minister if she can confirm her commitment to shared housing? by ensuring that new housing planned for the South Antrim area and indeed all all other areas will be shared housing areas and commit also to ensuring that all shared housing uh, projects are promoted and managed as inclusive for uh, all citizens. 
I think there was obviously in previous executives' commitments to look at the issue of shared housing, and it's part of the overall housing agenda in terms of building communities and neighbourhoods. But there is also a priority in me to ensure that I deliver housing going forward on the basis of objective need and where that objective need sits. And that's something that I will be outlining in the new housing development programme in the coming weeks. Uh, question number two has been withdrawn. Uh, I now call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Thanks very much. Um, licensing laws have remained largely unchanged since the 1990s, since there has been an increasing concern around um, alcohol-related harm. On the other hand, there have also been a change in the social landscape here, with people going out later to enjoy what the nighttime economy has to offer. For these reasons, reform of licensing laws is an executive priority under New Decade New Approach, and one that I am keen to progress as soon as possible. Last week in the Chamber, the First and Deputy First Ministers outlined the Executive's legislative programme. It includes a commitment to introduce the Licensing Reform Bill in the Assembly before the summer recess. Towards the end of last year, my department carried out a consultation on, uh, to determine public opinion on current licensing laws. It also sought the views um, of what, on what should be changed to make the system more modern and a more flexible one. And there was a huge response to this consultation exercise, with over 1,500 respondees were received to the consultation, with an overwhelming number of these, 1,418, coming from individual members of the public. I have engaged over the last few weeks with stakeholders as part of my consideration on these issues, and have heard at first hand the impact current uh, licensing framework is having. My officials have analysed the responses of the consultation, and I am considering these currently. And I will be moving with next step um, over the coming weeks. Um, the next step for me is obviously to send a draft report to the Committee for Communities and to allow members to, uh, time to comment on that consultation. And then an announcement will take place in the coming weeks. Case to Matthew Toole. Supplementary for Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, as we all know, pubs are a completely critical part of the fabric of our society here. They are part of the tourism offer on this island. They are a unique part of how we define ourselves and our communities. Um, however, in this part of Ireland, we have to put up with the absurd anachronism of our licensing laws, which have been overdue reform for far, far too long. Has the Minister given any consideration to the impact these absurd anachronistic licensing laws will have on pubs which are already struggling with the threat of increased rates bills, and indeed some of those pubs are dealing with the reduced connectivity thanks to the fly B um, collapse, and um, the impact that not delaying, not having these reforms in place by the time of Easter will have on these businesses. Well, I think just for this uh, piece, of course, it needs change. There's no doubt about that. I think most people um, reflect that there needs to be a change. Hence why the consultation was carried out, hence why it is now included in the legislative programme before the summer recess. It will not be done before Easter this year because the time restraint just would not um, allow that, because obviously it has to go through due diligence at committee and then into this chamber. But I am committed to bringing um, the paper to the executive in the coming weeks and then for that to go into the committee system and into the assembly itself. In the interim, I met with Hospitality Ulster and others. Um, obviously listened to their views and concerns and outlined my intent on the way forward. I call John Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for the update and the commitment to bring forward licensing legislation. Um, it is long overdue. One of the areas within um, this um, licensing laws that need, do need changed is support for our microbrewers and micro distillers. And she will know that uh, as part of the consultation, there was mass response from that industry. These are the innovators and the entrepreneurs of Northern Ireland, and there is a significant opportunity to drive the economy forward. Can you, Minister, give a commitment that um, those concerns and the limitations that that industry are facing will be heeded and reflected in the new uh, legislation? And also, will you commit um, to meet with Camera and other brewers whenever I bring them up here in two weeks' time, just to air their concerns ongoing? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, acutely aware of read articles and that over the last couple of weeks just relating to this issue, and obviously these are one of the new areas that was picked up in the most recent consultation that maybe wasn't there a number of years ago because obviously the industry has developed. So I am aware of the, the constraints that they have, and it's something that I'm considering strongly 
um, in the new legislation and proposals going forward. And if dairy commitments allow me, I'm more, no, more than happy um, to meet with them in the next two weeks. Call Paula Bradshaw. Um, Minister, you will be aware, as a, a fellow South Belfast MLA, that while pubs and hoteliers provide um, great benefits to our local economy, that there is sometimes a downside. Um, and so I am asking, what uh, way are you engaging with our councils around the renewal of entertainment licences as part of this process? Because, as you know, that sometimes they can contribute to the antisocial behaviour that falls out into our streets. Thank you. Yeah, well, obviously, I would have a good experience looking at issues in the Holy Lands and the Arm Road, being one, obviously, being a councillor in Belfast up until two months ago. Um, and obviously, I am reviewing the, uh, a review of entertainment's licensing as well. It will come forward soon, um, along with looking at uh, renewed gambling legislation as well. So, all of this is being considered in the round. Obviously, I will be moving firstly on the liquor licensing and the reform of that. Um, and in the coming months, I will be looking at the entertainment's licence and um, to look at those issues and obviously wanting to listen to residents, um, listen to drinking establishments and engaging with councils. I know they will be putting in formal responses to the review and consultation as they've done with the liquor licensing. So I'll be considering all of that in the round as I move forward with my recommendations. Next year, I'm Sarah Shania Dennis. Uh, call Shania Dennis. Um, I concur with the comments from the, uh, my colleague across the chamber, and I think uh, our restrictive licensing laws have really ha uh, hampered what is a growing industry in terms of the craft breweries. Um, and I hope that any legislation will, will reflect that and will uh, enable our craft breweries to, to glow, grow and flourish and, and actively um, contribute to our tourism product. But I wonder, will the minister, um, in the interim, would she look at increasing the opening hours for licensed premises, licensed premises uh, over the Easter period? Um, I'll consider that uh, going forward, so it's something I'll look at. In terms of the craft breweries um, and microbreweries, obviously the consultation has picked up those new emerging issues um, that are coming forward, so they will be reflected in the new legislation that will be put to the Assembly. As the member for the next question isn't in his place, I now call uh, Mr Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question five. Thanks very much for the question. Um, in March 2011, the Housing Executive allocated a budget of £110 million to deliver the regional stadia programme. While both rugby and soccer uh, stadia have been delivered, resulting in benefits for sport and the wider community, there have been delays to Caseman Park project. These delays have resulted in cost estimate increases, which are higher than the budget approved nine years ago. The member asked about the regional uh, stadium fund, and to clarify, in March 2011, the executive also endorsed a programme budget of £36.2 million for the sub-regional stadia programme for soccer to be confirmed in a future budget period. On that basis, the executive endorsed a programme budget of £36.2 million at that time. I have stated my clear intention to deliver against the commitments a new decade new approach agreement for both casement and also for the sub-regional stadia programme. Given that time has lapsed, it is important that the programme reflects the current need um, of the sector. And to that end, my officials have been, have been engaging over this last few weeks with key strategic stakeholders, including the IFA, the NI Football League and district councils to inform the development of detailed plans for delivering a successful sub-regional stadia programme. Once that engagement is complete, I will consider proposals on how best to take the programme forward, including budget considerations. Boris Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her, her detailed response? Uh, it's just that the, the, the state of the current football stadiums throughout Northern Ireland are, uh, I think they need emergency uh, help. And how soon do you think that you'll be able to roll out this programme and the funds will be available to be drawn down? As was said, uh, staff within my department within the sports branch are currently engaging with uh, the organisations. Obviously, even over the last, the initial report that was done in 2011 was updated in 2012. There was an interim review of the sub-regional stadium in 2016. 
but already that is almost 10 years and three years out of date. In between 2016, there have obviously been changes in terms of intermediate football, and obviously this has had a knock-on effect in terms of councils. So I want to make sure that anything that we're doing going forward is future-proofed in meeting the needs of soccer in the here and now, but also going forward. So I am keen to move on this as urgently as possible. Once those initial engagements are concluded, then I will outline my next plans in taking this forward. And I suppose just to touch on, I'm meeting with the IFA within the next few weeks, so I'll also be discussing this directly with them. I uh, thank the Minister for her response to Morris Bradley in relation to the Stadia programme. And she's already outlined that there are uh, plans to go out to further consultation on the uh, sub-regional. Can the Minister provide assurance that she will, and during her discussions with the IFA, certainly the issue around the primacy rule and designated grounds needs to be discussed, because it's actually going to uh, hamper other uh, sports or other soccer clubs? And could she also... Um, maybe provide details about any future sub-regional to the three big sporting bodies? Are there any plans to introduce any funding measures for those in the future? Yeah, firstly, just the meeting with the IFA. All of those matters will be um, part of the discussion that I do have with the IFA. And obviously, I need to work closely with them in the time ahead to ensure that the investment um, that this Assembly puts in has a really long-lasting impact in terms of sports and participation in sports. Um, in terms of the other issues, when I looked at the sub-regional stadia, obviously, uh, the two other stadia in terms of rugby and Gaelic games weren't included. I know there was a previous commitment from, minister, um, from a previous minister, apologies, in terms of a sub-regional uh, stadia phase two. And I've asked officials to start scoping this work out. Um, so I'll update committee and also this chamber in the time ahead once that work's done. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister um, if she will be seeking to uh, increase the budget available for the sub-regional football stadia fund, uh, similarly to the increase she is bidding for the regional stadia fund, and if, as part of her consultation, she will be engaging with football clubs, and if so, be delighted to invite her to visit Glen Torn Football Club in East Belfast. Well, the current budget commitments at the moment are £36.2 million for the sub-regional stadia. The increase in the Casement Park one, as I explained to committee and previously in this chamber, were all uncontrollable costs, obviously as a result of a judicial review hearing. There was a redesign of that stadium uh, where numbers were decreased. And also to take into account inflation over the last six years, um, with obviously increased inflationary rates year on year. We won't know the final budget, obviously, on that until planning permission has been determined, and then we'll start to go out in terms of the tendering programme. As I did say, the sub-regional stadia at the moment is £36.2 million, and I'm keen on making a commitment to deliver on that programme. And as I say, if there's a phase two, then to look at what else needs to be done um, in terms of soccer, but also then Gaelic games and rugby as well. I have had invites from a number of teams of 700 invites in at the moment from right across the remit of the department. And obviously, it's going to take time to get through those. I want to engage with the Sport and Code, and that's why I'm meeting with the IFA. But I'm more than happy to go out and try and meet as many local football teams as I can. And Glen Torn have a good lobby. I've had a number of invites. But more than happy to do that when the timetable allows me. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Just to follow on from, from Mr Little's point, uh, if my maths is right, the, the uplift for casement is, is 43 per cent. Would the Minister commit to a similar 43 per cent uplift to the sub-regional uh, stadia, which I think would take the figure up to 51.8 million pounds? And again, I would love to invite her to visit Arts Football Club, but we don't have a permanent home. Well, the reasons for the casement uplift, I mean, there was a court case here, which is different to what's happening within the sub-regional stadia programme. And obviously, I have to consider uh, casement in terms of the regional significance that this stadium will have. And obviously, because of the reasons for the increases around health and safety is around the redesign of the stadium and also because of the six-year delay. There is a commitment to deliver on the £36.2 million in terms of the sub-regional stadia, but as I said, I have already started scoping work as well to look at a phase two 
which would look at new monies potentially coming forward to address any outstanding issues for those three sporting codes of soccer, rugby and Gaelic games. I am more than happy, if time permits, to go and visit. I call George Robinson. Speaker, question six. Thanks very much uh, for your question. My department, through its regeneration programmes, has an important role in delivering the executive's programme for government outcome 10. This is creating places where people want to live, work, to visit and invest. These regeneration programmes are designed uh, to reverse the economic, social and physical decline in areas where market forces uh, will not do this without our support. Our main programme um, are the public realm and revitalisation schemes, which are delivered in close partnership with local councils. Officials in the appropriate development offices liaise with local councils in the planning and delivery of these schemes. My department has invested £11 million in a number of urban regeneration projects within your constituency. £10.7 million has been spent on the Port Rush Regeneration Programme, which was to prepare the town for the successful Open Championship. In addition, £213,000 revitalisation scheme was recently delivered in Limavati. This complements previous public realm works carried out in the town. My officials will continue to work with Causeway Coast and Glens Borough Council to, del- to, consider regen- re- sorry, to consider regeneration initiatives in towns within this constituency and have recently agreed to provide funding to allow a public realm scheme at the recreation grounds in Port Roush to proceed to full design. Thank the Minister <coughs> for her answer. Supplement. <coughs> Thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister outline any planned projects her department has to improve access to accredited training for young people in my East London Derry constituency? I don't have those details at hand, but I'll follow that up in writing to you. Call Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, delighted to hear that there are more public realm uh, schemes in the pipeline for East Derry. It's great to see them wherever uh, they may be. Can the Minister uh, give an assurance to the House that any maintenance contracts associated uh, with the upkeep of such schemes can ensure or at least demand swift response from contractors to repair uh, remedial defects? Yeah, all of these things are obviously considered when you're going to procurement, and it is an issue that has been raised recently, so it is something that we're scoping out and looking at, and obviously we will consider um, that as we're writing out procurement contracts in the time ahead. So if you have specifics, Member, I'll be happy to just uh, respond to you directly, um, but it is an area that obviously we want to tighten up on um, in the foreseeable future. Called Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and, and I again welcome the, the words around increase in um, public realm works. The Minister may be aware that there is a considerable issue among some of the legacy public realm schemes where there has been a, a failure to supply adequate disability access. Would the Minister commit here from the dispatch box today that going forward uh, disability rights and indeed access will be at the forefront of any public realm, realm schemes that are coming forward from the Department? Yeah, it's an important point to ensure that all of our public schemes are accessible to all members of the public. And obviously, I have responsibility for the disability strategy going forward, um, which will include co-design with those who are disabled and organisations that uh, represent them. So the issue of regeneration and public space is something that we'll consider as part of that strategy. But I'm more than happy. Um, if there are any specifics in terms of legacy projects, I'm more than happy to look at those. But in the time ahead, it is to look to give a commitment to ensure that we do design public spaces that are public, that are accessible to uh, people, no matter what their abilities are. Um, so give a commitment that we can do that in the time ahead. Emma Rogan, for your cash. I now call Emma Rogan. Can I ask the Minister for an update on a new disability strategy? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, in line with the new decade, new approach, I will be publishing a timescale for the delivery of the new disability strategy in the coming weeks. And obviously, that um, deal sets out that I publish a timescale on all of the strategies by the end of March. So, I have a commitment um, to meet that timetable. 
As uh, was said there, the strategy will be developed using a co-design approach, uh, which will be based on meaningful engagement with disabled people um, at all stages of the process. My department will work closely with disability stakeholders and engage with people at the grassroots to identify the issues and barriers that are faced by disabled people in the North. The disability sector has spoken to me about ensuring the voices of disabled people are heard and are, um, has emphasised the need for measurable outcomes that will make a real and lasting difference to be built into the new strategy. I trust that my commitment of embedding the principles of co-design and co-production into the strategy's development will address these concerns. Through this approach, we will work together with stakeholders and other government departments, which is obviously key. This has to cut right across the executive and government departments to put in place a strategy that targets and measures the things that will make a noticeable uh, improvement to the quality of life for all those with disabilities. And I am committed to ensuring that the most vulnerable uh, people have their voices heard and receive equal opportunities to participate in society. And this will be reflected throughout the development and implementation of our new disability strategy. And just to end, I mean, I'm, they're drawing up a terms of reference for that at the moment to look at who the engagement groups are. But it will be important that we do engage those on the grassroots. And obviously, we'll be engaging with the sector as to the best way to do that in the time ahead. Emma Rogan. Um, how will you ensure um, that all the departments are signed up to deliver on their commitments in this strategy? Well, I have asked for engagement across all of these strategies that it's senior officials within each of the other departments to ensure that it's people that are over policies within their own departments, that can make decisions within their own departments, that can look at the allocation of budgets within their own departments as well. So that will be picked up within the terms of reference. And obviously, then there's a responsibility on the other ministers to ensure that the officials that are sent are those at a superior, uh, uh, sorry, a, a high enough level that can then take the strategy forward in a meaningful way. Called Paula Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I also thank the Minister for her answers thus far. And we know that the Department of Communities has got many, many strategies that have been waiting an awfully long time um, to bring forward, so I welcome the fact that she hopes to bring some of those forward uh, before the end of March. Um, we had a, a briefing last week with engaged communities, and it was highlighted us uh, the, the lack of a, an art strategy. Just to add to the list, um, I just asked the Minister would she also consider that in the round also? Yeah, no, thanks very much. It's an issue that I've looked at very early on um, in terms, obviously, we have an arm's length body, the Arts Council, um, but it is something that I'm looking at within the department around how we can develop a coherent overarching art strategy from the department um, that will then impact in terms of the Arts Council as well. So once I start to formulate my position and approach around that, I'm more than happy to come and present that to the committee and then ultimately to the Assembly if, if it's requested. Paul Kelly Armstrong. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I'm delighted to hear the Minister say today about her commitment to co-production and co-design. I'm very interested when she referenced the terms of reference that are going to be used for the disability strategy. Can I ask how many people with disabilities are actually working to pull together those terms of reference? I'm not sure in terms of individual staff members. Um, the terms of reference at the moment is obviously within our equality unit within the department in terms of looking at international obligations, but also domestic um, law as well around equality and disability rights. The terms of reference then, before they're formally adopted, I will be discussing them with the sector to ensure that co-production starts from the terms of reference themselves. And I'll be doing this across all of the strategies that my department has the responsibility for. Um, so I'll lay that out in the time ahead. I don't have the draft back yet. I've just done an initial meeting, um, but I will lay that out in the time ahead. But they will see it in draft before it's then implemented and signed up to. Time for a great quick question. Iram Sarshanid Brad. Mr Speaker, am I too welcome the news that the strategy is moving forward and the co-production to co-design design that there are those voices in there of disabled people. But I would ask the Minister, um, whilst she has those people at the table, stakeholders and more importantly the, the voices of disabled people, could she also tell me what scoping exercise, if any, will be carried out to look at international good practice? I think that will be part um, of what the group moving forward are going to look at 
because obviously this has to reflect international human rights and embedding that at a domestic level, but also looking at good practice as to what other governments and local authorities are doing, uh, both here um, and obviously across the island and across these islands more broadly. So I'm more than happy, I imagine, that will be directed by those involved in the development of the strategy, which is a co-design piece. But obviously looking at international standards and best practice across all of these strategies will be one element that will be addressed seriously. Uh, before we move now to the topical question, just want to clarify to members to continue to indicate if they wish to ask a question during those oral questions. Otherwise, it will be presumed at the top table that they are either fully informed by the previous answers given by the Minister and no, no requirement to ask those questions. Thank you. Uh, I now move to the topical questions and I call Trevor Clark. Mr Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, I'm sure the Minister is aware about the high number of people who make applications um, for PIP applications. Um, has the Minister any idea how many people actually go into a later stage of appeal and those are overturned? I don't have those exact figures uh, with me, uh, but I can send them to you um, in response. Um, I know that there is a higher rate in terms of appeals that are overturned, and obviously it's something that I'm seriously considering in the time ahead. I will be outlining plans in terms of looking at the social security system overall, which includes PIP, universal credit, any future mitigations. And obviously I want to engage with the sector, um, the advice sector, human rights organisations, the Human Rights Commission, for example, and particularly those who are impacted by the social security benefits to see what we can do to improve them, to ensure that they protect the most vulnerable and that they are embedding a rights-based approach um, in terms of the impact that the social security system should have on protecting the most vulnerable, but more than happy to provide you in writing with the specifics. Mr Clark for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Can I ask the Minister maybe even in the short term if a piece of work could be done in relation to the number of people who actually are subsequent, sorry, refused their, their initial application but subsequently overturned the appeal? Given that we hear in many of our offices where people go for appeals that they, the appeal panel would suggest to the people they shouldn't have been here in the first place, would suggest that there's actually a problem with some of the people who are carrying out the initial assessments? Independent review that's being done at PIP at the moment. Marie Kavanagh, who's a former head of Gingerbread, so obviously she comes from the sector which represents people at the grassroots who are impacted. So I'll look forward to hearing. I haven't been involved in that yet because it's independent, so I can't engage. But I know that she's asking to speak to people on the ground. There's been uh, information that has went out to the advice sector where she, as the independent assessor, wants to engage with those to look at the experience. She's obviously going to engage with my department and officials as well. Because obviously we want to get to a point at a system that really meets the needs of the people as and when they need it and that it doesn't have to go to an appeal process. So I will be looking at that, but I'm not just going to rest and wait on that independent review. I will be outlining in the coming weeks plans to look at the social security system, which includes PIP, and how we can make it more effective to meet the needs of those who need it the most. So I'm more than happy to discuss it with you um, after this, um, but also in the time ahead, I'll be coming back to you outline my plans. The next question from Mr Kelly has been withdrawn. So Anish, Iram, Sir Martina Anderson, for your guest. Call Martina Anderson. Good morning, uh, Minister. I welcome the most recent announcement with regards to the Neighbourhood Renewal Funding. And I was with a number of organisations like the Glen Development Initiative, and they were very pleased around the workers' rights that you were. That was part of what you announced that you were looking at. But could you outline uh, how the funding will assist those in the most deprived areas accessing best services? Yeah, well, obviously, as uh, members may know, I wrote out to Neighbourhood Renewal Partnerships just over a week ago to advise them that I'm securing uh, the funding as is for this year, but also into the next financial year as well. And that's really to give certainty because um, there's over 900 people that's employed through the Neighbourhood Renewal Programme, and that's delivering a variety of services, both within the community, but also within a statutory setting in our most top 10 depraved communities. So it was fundamental for me, as somebody who came from a neighbourhood renewal um, position and who lives in a neighbourhood renewal area, that I give that certainty. 
I also give a commitment that neighbourhood renewal areas will be involved in a co-design of whatever the new programme will look like. So obviously there's a need to review the neighbourhood renewal programme to ensure that it is meeting the need, to ensure that we're looking at how we eradicate poverty and address inequality. So those partnerships and those communities will be involved in a co-design process over the next two years um, for the programme. Also, as you touched on, I have initiated a review looking at workers' rights because there are concerns and issues and that people haven't had a pay increase over the last nine years. Uh, there's not uh, maternity leave um, entitlements to those working within the community and voluntary sector. And obviously, it's a sector I have worked in my whole life. Um, and I have committed to an urgent review to look at all of those issues and how we can address them. And I'll be meeting with the neighbourhood partnership chairs on the 18th of March um, to discuss these issues going forward. Uh, thank you. Mr. Martina Anderson, supplementary. Uh, thank you, thank you, Minister, for that comprehensive answer. And I think it's very welcome news to hear that you are meeting with the neighbourhood renewal chairs and in line with the planning of that review. Their workers would also like to be involved in this co-design as well. And I'm wondering, is that part of your outreach work um, when you're taking this plan forward? The review will be with the partnerships, with those involved in the partnerships, with those who develop programmes but more widely as well those within the neighbourhood renewal area, because obviously things have changed in the last 10 years, 15 years from neighbourhood renewal and the people in place strategy was first implemented. So we need to make sure that we, in a new programme going forward, that we're addressing the new and current needs, but also those needs that may emerge in the time ahead. So I want it to be a serious co-design approach. Part of my uh, engagement on the 18th will be to start to look at how we start to address that and also working with, for example, the Human Rights Commission in terms of human rights issues and again embedding a rights-based approach um, to this programme. I'm sorry, Leahy Flynn, if I you cash to call Orly Flynn for a question. Uh, Gormi, I'll get last, can call you. Uh, can the Minister uh, make a commitment for her department to work alongside the Department of Health to help progress the implementation of the Protect Life 2 strategy? Yes, thanks very much for your question. And obviously, the executive's new uh, working group looking at the issue of health and well-being, mental health and well-being, and also suicide met for the first time last week. And obviously, Minister Swan chairs that group. Um, and it was a good discussion at the meeting from all of the ministers who were there, including uh, the two first ministers. Um, and there is a commitment uh, that we will follow up with specific actions within my department for communities as to what we're doing. Um, in terms of looking at uh, positive mental health and wellbeing and also the issue of suicide, to see if there's more actions that we can be doing. But more importantly, there was a good discussion that these issues are cross-cutting issues across the departments. And it is important that resources, um, that commitment and time and priorities that are put in are, are, sorry, are shared and discussed across and that they're not um, sectionalised within each of the departments. So there is a commitment uh, to working with the Health Minister on that strategy, but also to look at mental health and wellbeing more broadly. And obviously within my department, I have good instruments to do that around social security benefits, um, around housing, around tackling inequality within our most deprived communities. And all of these issues, obviously, I rely on the Department of Health and all the departments in terms of the implementation going forward. So I do have a commitment that I will continue that engagement uh, with Robin, but also with this House as a whole on this crucial issue. Um, and I would like to thank the Minister for her response. Um, I'd also like to commend some of the sporting and community activists um, who have recently um, established a new wellbeing forum within my constituency of West Belfast. Um, and maybe built on the Department's uh, wellbeing and sport action plan, does the Minister agree that we need more mental health awareness training and initiatives for sporting and community groups such as the wellbeing um, forum in West Belfast? Thank you. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I mean, I suppose the participation in sport and physical activity um, has a really strong role to play in terms of addressing positive mental health and wellbeing and also tackling the issue of suicide. Um, and obviously working with the department and also Sport NI and partner bodies, we're looking at how we can increase efforts uh, to that regard. Part of that will include looking at training programmes. And again, this is where the discussion with 
uh, the Minister of Health last week and with the other ministers. When you look across the departments, there's a variety of programmes and training that is being organised, and we just need to make sure that it's having the impact um, that it needs to have, that it's targeting those areas that we know. And I mean, one of the, I suppose, alarming figures, but it's not unsurprising, that it's areas of poverty and deprivation that really feel the impact of this. Um, and particularly as we're a society emerging from a political conflict, we also need to build in, um, I suppose, addressing those issues as well. Uh, so committed to doing that and obviously how we can involve our sports and community sector because in many ways they are leading um, the debate and the campaign on these issues and we need to support them in doing that. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the rich cultural and heritage associated with my constituency of Strangford. In light of the commencement of the latest events grant scheme for Belfast, does the Minister have any plans to introduce similar grant schemes for other parts of Northern Ireland? Thank you, uh, Member. Um, I suppose I answered some of this in a question a few weeks ago. The Belfast grant scheme is something of a legacy programme that has been there for a long time. Um, and whilst there's no uh, intent to develop out other programmes, my department does work with other councils, the other 10 councils, in running programmes. We obviously do a festivals fund which is disseminated across the 11 councils in which programmes are developed. We have regeneration, and indeed some of the monies from our regeneration programmes and also the neighbourhood renewal programmes go into events and funding. But I know I'll be meeting with the members soon, so I'm more than happy to look at specific issues. And if there's anything that we can do within the department to look at specific programmes, more than happy to uh, consider it and discuss it with you. Mr Harvey, for a supplementary. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her answer, and would she agree with me it is vital that we use any publicly funded grants to grow our tourist potential and attract more major events to all parts of Northern Ireland? Yeah, I think we see the impact that having events and international events can do on a, on a place. Um, and I think there will be an importance of working with local government because they know the issues on the ground, they know the impact, they know the cultural and arts organisations in which we can dovetail into. And I think if we can adopt a partnership approach to these events going forward, then I'm more than happy to do it. I know my officials are already engaging with the 11 councils and with your own council area, but if there's something specific um, that we could look at, then I'm more than happy to do that. Call William Humphrey. Um, can I just ask the Minister, and thank you for her answer so far. Last year I met with the Chief Executive of the Housing Executive and the Permanent Secretary of the Minister's Department in relation to Finlock Cuttering in Silverstream, in my constituency of North Belfast. Many constituents have been enduring really dreadful conditions in terms of dampness. There have been previous schemes where uh, other parts of the estate have been addressed. Can I ask the Minister to work with her department and the Housing Executive to address this issue and put an end to these appalling conditions that people have been enduring for so many years? Yeah, thanks very much for your questions. I don't have the specifics to that case, but I'm more than happy to go and look at it um, after this meeting. I am meeting with the Chair of the Board of the Housing Executive soon, um, and obviously looking at issues of um, upgrading our stock and looking at the issue of damp has come up in those discussions, but more than happy to bring up this specific issue and then write back to you with, a, with an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Pray for thank you, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Deputy Speaker. Can I, can I just then ask the Minister, in relation to, on the 9th of January, we some information from received some information from your department in relation to cricket and funding for cricket over the last five years. And if I can just might say that over the last five years, the department has funded funded somewhere in the region of 1.8 million pounds towards cricket. And I should declare an interest as a vice president of Woodville Cricket Club. Um, but sadly, only 232,000 pounds of that has actually gone to local cricket clubs in Northern Ireland. Could I ask the Minister to address this a situation? I was speaking to the President of the Northern Cricket Union on Friday. Local cricket clubs are struggling. They need support. They need funding. And really, this is a derisory amount of money over a five-year period, given the amount of money that's given £1.1 million to Cricket Ireland uh, over that same period. Yeah, well, I hit a cricket ball in Woodfield Park a number of years ago when I was in Belfast City Council. And it's an excellent venue um, just up within Woodfield. You wouldn't think it was there until you walk in. 
Um, but I'm more than happy, obviously, Sport NI are our main arm's length body in terms of the dissemination of funds um, for sport and events and also with the sport and codes. But more than happy to look at that issue and engage with the cricket union um, in the time ahead uh, to see what we can do. That concludes topical questions, and we now must move on to the questions to the Minister for the Economy. <clears throat> the Minister has given notice to the Speaker. That